tonight. But uh, let's start with Darwin because uh, it is the last uh, lecture of the course and we should remind you uh, about what the theory of evolution is like and uh, where, where it came from. Um, and Darwin had not just one idea of like evolution, there were a whole range of ideas embedded in his thinking uh, that um, all meshed together uh, in his uh, great work, The Origin of Species. Um, but this idea of, of natural selection, and variation, and domestication, war of nature, all sorts of ideas to going together. And my interest in this, uh, I, I guess, goes back several decades. Um, there's Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859. I do have on my shelves the entire collected works of Darwin. You'll see that the spine isn't broken on most of them, but I do have them. And 10 years ago, I wrote a book called The Rough Guide to Evolution, which led me to look into all these things in a, a bit more detail than you would if you were just casually browsing over the subject. And one of the things that caught my eye when I was uh, doing the research for that book was looking at the evolution of ideas and how Darwin came to, to come to his ideas. Um, and his notebooks that he kept, he was a, a very um, enthusiastic keeper of notebooks, uh, actually contained all sorts of interesting things. Uh, there were these uh, series of notebooks that he kept over the years, uh, very wide-ranging interests he had, speculating about all sorts of things. Um, and one of the ideas was this idea of evolution, and particularly the idea of branching evolution. Um, and this is the, the first um, sketch he ever did of an evolutionary tree where the dots are uh, extinct forms and then the, he, he fleshed in their uh, living forms showing that they might be related in this kind of branching evolution kind of way. This was back, way back in the 1830s. And one of the particular lines I like in one of his notebooks is that he, he, he says, if we choose to let conjecture run wild, animals are fellow brethren in pain, disease, death and suffering and famine, our slaves in the most laborious works, our companions in our amusements. Uh, and then he makes the evolutionary point, they may partake from our origin in one common ancestor, we may all be netted together. So the, common, uh, the, the, the current thinking about how humans and the animal world and the, uh, and the planet are all joined together by our evolutionary past, Need some people uh, to um, take an animal rights stance to say that animals uh, have rights. Uh, others to take the view that we shouldn't be eating animals because they are relatives and so forth. All goes, if you like, back to Darwin um, and, and his notebooks. The notebooks are obviously just the, the predecessor, the, the, the preamble to his great work, The Origin of Species, which he published in 1859. It was published on November the 24th, a few days ago, uh, uh, um, 160 years ago. Now, I'm sure as people are doing a course on evolution, you've all read this book. Has anyone actually read The Origin of Species? Has anyone tried to read The Origin of Species? Lady like over there is saying that she, you tried or you did? I tried. Yeah, okay, you tried. It, it's, it's one of those things where uh, there's a lot of... Um, slow uh, kind of dull accumulation of facts and then occasionally the language soars into uh, eloquence. Uh, but these are the chapter headings from The Origin of Species um, and in the rest of this talk I'm going to be showing you how many of these topics that Darwin touched upon where, and Darwin when he wrote The Origin of Species didn't know about the existence of E. coli, he didn't even know about the existence of bacteria but many of the same ideas are applicable when we look at uh, e. coli and the evolution of E. coli and it does illustrate these points. Just again to remind you of what Darwin's uh, influence has been on modern thought, so this guy Ernst Meyer um, uh, had a very long life uh, and uh, basically uh, it almost spans the time of, uh, um, of Darwin to the modern time. Uh, he he, he wrote a piece saying that basically this idea of branching evolution and the common descent of all living things from a single origin was one of Darwin's key ideas. Uh, 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 but he also had, Darwin also had this idea of that mechanism of evolution is largely natural selection, evolution is gradual. Um, and evolutionary biology in many ways is a, is a historical science. So we try and reconstruct what's happened in the past and the processes that have already taken place. 
um, um, and that uh, is, a, is a, a key part of what we do. We're not just looking at what's going on now, but we're looking on how these processes worked in the past. The idea uh, that the feeds on variation and randomness, so for a physicist, if they take one electron, it's basically a representative of all electrons in the universe. It's just the same kind of thing. Whereas for us, any organism that we see there is just one example of that species. And there is lots of variation in the species. And some people find that quite troubling. They don't like this mess of variation. But that is the seed corn of what we uh, do in evolutionary biology. Uh, and also, um, banished, uh, Darwin banished this idea of typology and determinism, that the one organism can be the type or uh, specimen for that whole species or for a whole uh, phylum, if you like. Um, and in fact, there is. It's just this wonderful variation across all of nature. Okay, that's just a preamble to warm your brains up about Darwin. Now let's talk about E. coli. So Escherichia coli uh, was discovered in 1885 by a German-Austrian uh, physician, Theodor Escherich. Um, he just isolated this as an abundant organism that grew from babies' nappies. Um, no other context apart from that. Uh, it just came from the gut. Uh, he called it Bacteria coli communis because it was co coli from the colon and communis it was a common organism. It was renamed uh, in his honour uh, in 1919 as Escherichia coli um, and that's the name that we, it's carried ever since. Now interestingly E. coli is a key uh, um, uh, exemplar of the power of variation under domestication, which is the, the title of the first chapter in The Origin of Species. Now, a particular strain of E. coli called E. coli K12 was first isolated in 1922. Um, this again was just a kind of random thing. It was entirely uh, you know, idiosyncratic that they, uh, uh, people there isolated a strain from the feces of a convalescent diphtheria patient at Stanford University and there was nothing special about that patient, that patient's bowel, that particular E. coli, but that particular uh, strain became, uh, if you like, the, the, the most commonly used experimental uh, uh, strain and probably, I can say without fear of constriction, probably the most studied organism on the planet. Uh, and uh, E. coli, as it uh, was domesticated, became uh, uh, really the, the workhorse of um, biology, not just evolutionary biology, but many different biological principles were um, looked at here. So Beadle and Tatum, they, they looked at the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. I think they were working in Neurospora rather than E. coli, but they then turned their hand to K12 and started irradiating it to create mutants. Um, Tatum's student Lederberg uh, in 1946 showed that E. coli could exchange DNA different strains of E. coli could share DNA. Uh, so in the broader sense, if you can exchange DNA with a, 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 a kind of horizontal gene transfer sort of way, um, this is a kind of sex. But there's just a few screen grabs there from papers, key papers that show how uh, studies on E. coli have been so pivotal. So uh, mutations of bacteria from virus sensitivity to virus resistance. Uh, this was uh, a paper that showed that a mutation um, it, it precedes variation. Um, and it's now become one of the dogmas of Darwinian evolution, even though Darwin was a bit equivocal about this kind of thing, is that, it's not, that if you have some kind of um, change that you apply to a population, that change in itself doesn't change the genetic material of that population, it's simply... Um, selects for the variants that are already there uh, and that was shown by the, this, is, um, uh, this study here. Um, but the, one of the other key points to show was that the, the DNA was the genetic material so they showed here that viral protein and nucleic acid had different roles in bacteriophages that predated on E. coli um, and uh, DNA in fact nucleic acid was the hereditary material rather than uh, what people thought at the time, maybe it could have been protein. And then uh, the Maisel Stan and Stahl experiment, Maisel Stan and Stahl experiment, where they, they showed in E. coli uh, the se semi um, 
uh, independent replication of E. coli, uh, semi-conservative replication of E. coli, I should say, where um, where the, uh, the DNA strand uh, they, they labelled it with um, uh, radioactivity and showed that there was this um, uh, the, the duplication of the genetic material um, in this uh, semi-conservative way. But that's just the start. I mean, in, the, in recent decades, so much more has been done using uh, E. coli uh, as a domesticated organism and using it to understand biology. So Jacob and Monon won the Nobel Prize for, for, for um, discovering that they were that genes weren't just working one at a time. They were arranged in sets called operons, where the whole operon uh, was under um, common regulatory control through a promoter that sits at the beginning there. Understanding and deciphering the genetic code all of that took place in E. coli. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, genetic engineering uh, uh, took place in, in E. coli. So, so Boyer and Cohen showed that you could manipulate plasmids in E. coli, you could cut them with restriction enzymes, and then you could ligate bits of DNA into them and propagate them in E. coli. And nowadays, um, in both systems biology and synthetic biology, E. coli is still the paradigmic organism, the one that everyone uses. Uh, if, if you like one simple example of how important all of this understanding of E. coli has been, and this exploitation of E. coli has been, is that millions of diabetics around the world now rely on insulin that is just is made in E. coli. And that's just one example of the products that E. coli makes. So uh, mono actually... Uh, in this kind of Delphic utterance, in, in French, uh, summarised the role of E. coli in, in biology by saying that all that is true of E. coli is also true of the elephant. Um, and in many ways, you know, that is, that's, a, that's a great insight there. The, the genetic code that was deciphered in E. coli works in the elephant as well. Uh, an E. coli ribosome and an elephant ribosome look pretty much the same and they work on similar principles and so forth. And if you're interested in, 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 in the role of E. coli in science, uh, Carl Zimmer, um, a science journalist and author uh, from the US, wrote a piece on this, I wrote a book on this called Microcosm a few years back where he summarised all of this. But what I've shown you there is how the experimentalist work, and sometimes a theoretician, if there's a system biologist, views E. coli um, as a, a kind of lab work or something they want to work on. Um, but I've uh, worked alongside people who use E. coli purely to understand things, to dissect promoters and so forth. But I've also worked alongside people who view E. coli uh, as it lives out in the wild, as a pathogen and so forth. And one of the um, things I said, that look, the people working on it as a model organism, they kind of forget that it's an evolved organism, that it has its own ecology out there. They kind of imagine that God created this, this organism that they work on, this particular strain, K12MG1655. And they never think about, well, how do they think that their findings sit in an evolutionary context? How far can they generalize from that E. coli strain to other E. coli strains, to other species, um, and more generally. Um, and if, um, in fact, if we look again at this idea of variation under domestication, what you find is that even the, uh, the strains that are being used in laboratories nowadays uh, are not natural strains. They're not, they are, they've undergone a variation under domestication. They've been uh, 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 mutated in the lab, and here's one simple phylogeny of, of this particular MG1655. So the original isolate in 1922, um, it was then various mutations were selected for, uh, it was irradiated with ultraviolet radiation to create more mutations, um, then selected for an acridine orange, another powerful mutagen. And so what, we, uh, what people study in the lab as E. coli and real E. coli out there in the, in the real world are actually different things, and we have to remember that. Um, and in, in, you know, this is one of those points um, that Ernest Heckel was making, that it's very easy to 
fall into typological thinking. Oh, I'm working on the type of the whole, uh, 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 this illustrates everything, when in fact you're just working on one small example. Um, and a few years ago, actually, I, I got so cross about this, this way of thinking that I actually wrote a, a piece uh, for the journal Molecular Microbiology where we, we said, you know, are these laboratory strains, are they really model citizens or really should we be seeing them as deceitful delinquents growing old disgracefully? Um, because the other issue is that if you take different strains of E. coli that's supposed to be the same strain in different laboratories around the world, they actually vary as well. So you have to take into account the fact they're evolving over time. Um, and you know, rather fancifully, I made the point that this this might you consider this to be E. coli in the state of nature, um, and then uh, you um, apply some uh, uh, stresses to it and selective pressures, and it starts to turn into something looking a bit like that. You know, not not what you would see in nature, but an artificial kind of construct. And then before long you get to it being a, a kind of icon of, of biology that really quite removed from real world biology and, and um, this is a, an issue that um, one has to continually confront uh, when people are trying to make conclusions about E. coli. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a preamble about how E. coli as a laboratory organism has become uh, domesticated and has evolved over to, under domestication. But there is uh, one key experiment that's been performed on E. coli that illustrates this point even further that you can get evolution in the laboratory. Uh, it, it's often called the Lensky experiment after the, the man who set it up and I'll introduce you to him in a moment because he, I've got a little video of him. Um, and what he wanted to do was to, to say well can we learn about evolution by studying E. coli you know, in terms of dynamics of evolution and rates of change, what, what happens if we just keep subculturing in the laboratory? And is evolution repeatable? And this is one of those key questions, you know, is, is, there, is there some way in which that, that, that you can predict that it's going to go along certain grooves in certain ways? You know, if the asteroid that destroyed the dinosaurs hadn't hit, would we still have evolved? Or is, is, is evolution just contingent upon certain events and accidents and so forth? Um, and also to understand the relationship between change in, in the genome and how that's reflected in the phenotype. And so back in, um, in 1988, uh, this experiment was started with these 12 flasks, 12 independent pop well, populations that were the same population but put into 12 different uh, um, flask and then propagated independently um, in the Lenski lab. Um, they're now maintained in, in Michigan State University. I think it started in California. Um, and each day, 1% of each population is transferred to a new flask. Um, and what that means is that each of the uh, E. coli populations is going through about 6.6 .6 generations per day. And then at every um, 500 generations, roughly every 500, every 75 days, what they would do is they would take a, a sample from the population and, and they'd freeze it. So in a sense what they were doing was creating a, a frozen fossil record of the evolution of the E. coli. Uh, and so that's a really cool aspect that, you know, if you try and understand plant or animal <coughs> evolution and you look at a fossil record, you can't go back and say, let's take um, a T. rex and pit it against a, a lion and see which one wins. You can't do those kind of experiments with animals and plants. Whereas with E. coli you can do that. You can just say, okay, how is this strain looking that we've got in this flask today compared to what we had one year ago, what we had five years ago, uh, which one is fitter under which conditions and so forth. So to save my voice and also just to bring a bit of um, variation, I'm just going to give you a little 10 minute video here where uh, Lenski is interviewed about this experiment and it just gives you the context of why he did this uh, experiment. So the, the, the official name for the experiment is the E. coli long-term evolution experiment. But let me just bring him up now. Welcome to the Triple A Oscillating here in Vancouver, British Columbia. We're standing here interviewing Richard Lenski, 
right in front of the digital orchid. Richard is the Hammond Professor of Microbial Ecology at Michigan State University. And you've been running what I think is the longest term experimental evolution project outside of nature that's ever been done. Is that right? That is right, Stan. I think it's definitely the longest, certainly in terms of the numbers of generations. Uh, we have 12 replicate populations of E. coli that have been evolving in this very simple laboratory environment for over 50,000 generations now. There is an experiment at the University of Illinois that's been breeding corn. It's a systematic experiment for about 110 years. Of course, they're only getting one generation a year from that. So that's a longer experiment, but certainly in terms of the numbers of generations, ours is the longest. So how many years is yours? So the experiment started in 1988, and this month it has its uh, 24th anniversary. That's pretty long time for any experiment. It is a long experiment. So, so what, have you, what have you learned from this long experiment? So we've learned a lot of things. Um, the simplest thing that we've learned is really just a confirmation of how efficient adaptation by natural selection is. That's the process that Darwin wrote to explain how organisms fit their environment. And with these bacteria... It's not the first diagram. It's the one I showed you. the first. In the freezer. And every 500 generations, we put samples from all 12 populations in the freezer. But because they're bacteria, we can bring them back to life. And we can do things like competing the evolved bacteria against their ancestors and really show, hey, they've adapted to their environment, they have genetic changes that improve their competitive ability relative to their ancestors. Are there some practical benefits of this for society? Some people think studies like about evolution are just of academic interest. Are, are there reasons this is critical for society to know about? So a couple of answers to that. Um, one is, although academic interest is kind of pejorative, I think curiosity is one of the most wonderful things about being a human being. So understanding this process, this ultimate power of creating the diversity of life, whether it's microbial diversity or diversity of mammals or whatever, this is just to me, we need to understand it. It's beautiful to understand how those things have come into play. At the same time, especially with microorganisms, there are tremendous applications here. Understanding how viruses evolve from one type that maybe doesn't infect humans into another type that does infect humans is tremendously important. The pharmaceutical industry spends billions of dollars every year on essentially trying to defeat evolution because when we add new antibiotics into the environment, new antivirals and so on, we're creating selection for microorganisms that are able to overcome uh, the, the drugs that we are presenting them with. This, this is really a timely period to be thinking about this because right now there's a lot of controversy about evolution of H5N1 influenza virus. That's right. And what the benefits are to society versus what the potential risks are. But are, are there potential risks of the kind of research you're doing too with E. coli? I don't think there are direct risks, and in part because of the environments in which we are evolving the bacteria. Um, we are evolving them essentially to become very domesticated bacteria. They're great at living in the flask. So I sometimes joke that we should change the name from Escherichia coli to Escherichia erlenmeyeri because that's the world they're adapting to. On the other hand, if we were propagating uh, these bacteria, or we also do some work with viruses that infect bacteria, if we were propagating them from one host animal to another, which I gather is part of this uh, uh, much discussed and potentially controversial work with H5N1, there you're selecting for things that potentially have greater transmissibility, the potential to be an airborne virus, uh, that very much is a public health concern. Now, many people talk about evolution in microbes as being microevolution, and they say, well, this is so different than evolution of humans and other higher, larger organisms. Yeah. But what do you say about that argument? Well, uh, in, in many respects, what, what one does do in the lab is primarily capturing microevolution in the sense of the processes we're seeing are ones that involve one or a handful of mutations natural selection acting on those mutations, a process called random drift acting on those mutations. But because microbes have so many generations in such a short period of time, one can at least begin to build outward from just looking at single changes to what happens over the course of decades at least. And in population sizes of not just hundreds of fruit flies or thousands of fruit flies, but here we're able, each one of our little flasks has millions and billions of, of bacteria in them.
And we're able then, in some of our experiments, to actually see rather large changes. So in this long-term experiment with E. coli, uh, they've been evolving to grow on glucose. That's the carbon source we gave them. But throughout these 20-some years, we had another carbon source in the medium called citrate. And although many bacteria can grow on citrate, one of the defining features of E. coli, going back to really its original description, is it doesn't grow on citrate. So our bacteria have been living in this environment where every day we feed them glucose, and they get better and better using the glucose. And then suddenly, over 15 years, about 15 years into this project, one of the populations suddenly said, huh, there's something else to eat besides the glucose. And they made this leap. Um, we're still working on understanding the genetics of it. That's very much an ongoing work. But we're trying to understand how they made this transition to use a carbon source that the ancestor could not use at all. So this is very powerful. Now, so I think uh, you can watch the rest of it if you like. There's only another five minutes or so. He also does research on uh, evolution in computers, where he builds artificial worlds and, and, and uh, artificial genetic systems and evolves them. But uh, yeah, let's get back to uh, the nuts and bolts of this uh, long-term evolution experiment. This is just a timeline uh, and just shows you quite uh, the, the amazing scope of how many generations uh, that have been going on here. I mean, if we took 30,000 human generations, uh, we'd be back to common ancestors with Neanderthals. Uh, and, uh, and you can see various, exper various uh, outcomes. I'll say more about those in a, mo in a moment. Uh, and this timeline finishes in 2016, but the, the experiment is still going on. And it probably will be going on in the indefinite future to see what happens to these different E. coli. So what kind of results did he get? Well, he got a, a range of uh, uh, takeaway messages here. So um, as he pointed out in that discussion there, there were these changes in fitness. So all the population showed a rapid increase in fitness uh, very early on. Uh, and that's because they're getting used to being in that environment, living with that particular carbon source of glucose and the other nutrients that are in there. Um, the rate of, of change started to decelerate a bit after, after time. But by 20,000 generations, you could take the ancestral strain and you could do growth curves on it. You could take the evolved strains and show the growth curves. And the evolved strains were 70 times faster in their growth rates uh, than the ancestor. So in that particular medium. So it's clear that uh, there is uh, natural selection going on in those flasks for those organisms. One of the interesting things when they started looking at uh, genome evolution, and when they started out, the idea of being able to sequence genomes at the drop of a hat was a very fanciful one. It, it now is the case that you can easily just do this uh, for a few pounds, but back then it wasn't. But what they found when they first started looking at this um, was that uh, half of their populations developed uh, DNA repair defects. And what this means is that the mutation rate then goes up. So if, if uh, the, the, an E. coli, just like a human cell, has quite a sophisticated apparatus to make sure that uh, uh, any defects in DNA are repaired uh, in a, uh, an efficient, timely fashion. And if you remove that, uh, what happens is you just get an increased mutation rate. Um, and they reckon that about, um, in, in each population, about 100 point mutations, 10 to 20 of them became fixed uh, in each population. Um, I'm not quite sure what, over what time scale, but fairly early on, I think, over in the first few years. Another thing that happened was that the cell size increased in all of the 12 populations. So it's interesting that, that you, what we're, by studying 12 populations, you can look at like convergent evolution, if you like, where natural selection is pushing things in a certain direction um, versus the, 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 the uh, uh, just purely stochastic variation. Um, and here it, it, it was uh, linked to a particular penicillin binding protein involved in, in uh, cell wall biosynthesis, and that change in expression of that was what led to this. Um, the uh, growth on glucose uh, improved, um, and there, was, there are arguments about whether this is an example of what's known as antagonistic pleiotropy, or whether it's just uh, neutral mutations on new screens. So some of the genes that were used for other purposes, for growing on other carbon sources and other uh, nutrients, were lost as um, you, the growth on, on glucose continued. Now, what, was their loss uh, a, a benefit to the cell? So it's not 
making those particular pathways because they in some way damage its ability to, to live uh, efficiently on glucose or are they they're not actually being selected against they just lost by by um, neutral mutations and that's not quite clear um, but another interesting phenomenon was that there was uh, in, in at least one population specialized um, specialization so two different populations co-evolved so what they called the L type and the S type for large colony variant and small colony variant types um, that, that could coexist stably from one generation to another um, neither one of them outcompeting the other they're just uh, living together uh, and it turned out that the L type appeared to have a, an advantage during the stationary phase growth so once they'd exhausted the nutrient in that particular flask and were uh, had gone into stationary phase um, Sorry, the other way, I got the other way The S-type had the advantage of stationary phase. And the L-type had the advantage during the log phase growth when they were growing on, on, on glucose and, and, and as they were going as fast as they could. So it's interesting that, there, that you get this. It's almost, you could argue, this is almost incipient speciation. If we fast forwarded another 10,000 or a million generations, maybe these organisms would become so different that we'd call them different species. Now the point he made in his in that little uh, video I showed, uh, w uh, uh, that one of the big takeaway uh, messages was that the development of a new function, the ability to grow aerobically on citrate, uh, and so normally the uh, E. coli can't grow on citrate, particularly the ancestral strain couldn't grow on citrate, but what they found was there was this dramatic increase in turbidity in one particular population by this particular generation, 33,127. Um, and when they looked at that, they realized that the reason that it was growing so much more efficiently and to a greater um, optical density was because it had a, a, a acquired this ability to, to, to grow on citrate. Um, and they were able to rerun that experiment and, and show that, um, that various things had happened in the background um, uh, that need, were needed to actually prime uh, the appearance of this particular phenotype. Um, so the first stage that was needed was uh, uh, mutations need to accumulate to increase the rate of mutation. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, if you, if you destroy your DNA repair genes, your mutation rate goes up, and that provides more opportunities for the cells to actually explore, if you like, the evolutionary landscape of opportunities open to them. And then when the trait first appeared, it was uh, in a fairly weak form. So it appeared before they noticed it in a very weak form. And then over time, uh, additional mutations appeared. Once that, if you like, once the, the evolution had tracked onto that particular phenotype as something that was useful and beneficial, then additional mutations uh, were um, selected for that improve that particular trait. Um, and uh, when they looked into the um, uh, biochemistry and the genomics of this, what they found, the genetics of this, what they found was that there'd actually been a, a gene duplication or a segment, a segment of DNA that got duplicated um, and, and then also uh, a piece of DNA moved around. So that the citrate genes, the CIT gene, um, which was involved in um, transport of, of, of citrate uh, into the cell, this, um, this gene was normally silent because it had no promoter expressing it. But uh, a promoter from a, a, a different gene, as the so-called RNK promoter, uh, got shoved in front of the gene and uh, allowed it to be expressed under conditions that were useful to it uh, in the flask to actually... Um, use citrate. So this is an example of, of evolution in action where um, a trait that wasn't there uh, is selected for, actually comes about through a mutation which is selected for. And uh, as I say, this, this study is still ongoing. This is a paper, I think it was from earlier this year, where they're now looking at the dynamics of molecular evolution over 60,000 generations. Um, and these uh, figures here just show you the um, changes in um, allele frequency, the trajectories of these alleles over all these different generations. And you can see in each different population, each of the 12 different populations, you can see a very different picture. 
So it's clear that evolution isn't something that's entirely predictable. Uh, there is a degree of randomness, as, not just in the making of the mutations, but in, in what gets selected for, uh, which one wins, which uh, population wins out in a particular situation uh, over time. Okay, so I spent a bit, uh, quite a bit of time on Lenski's experiment. Uh, this is a, perhaps an example of a more general phenomenon. We don't have to actually do those lab experiments uh, to see natural selection in E. coli because it's going on all the time with the use of antibiotics and antimicrobial agents. Um, and it's, it's now uh, a truism that uh, you can take an original population and you can um, uh, apply selective pressure by giving antibiotics and you can select for resistance. Um, and this has now become a major area of societal concern. Uh, there's this penguin special, the drugs don't work. Uh, telling us about how um, this is threatening human um, uh, well-being uh, and animal well-being if we no longer can use antibiotics because of the emergence of resistance. Um, and I'm not going to say a lot about this. Um, uh, I suspect you've probably had uh, lectures on this, but here's one example where we get uh, what we, we might call selective sweeps going on, where we get a, a new clone of eco like this particular sequence type 131 that has swept across the world um, and is uh, a, a, a big problem um, uh, in particularly in extraintestinal infection but it can colonize the the intestine as well um, and it, it is as it has evolved it has acquired uh, in stepwise fashion resistances to uh, one antibiotic after another so it started off uh, being resistant to the fluoroquinolones, antibodies like ciprofloxin through, through a point mutation. Um, and then um, it acquired various genes through a process of horizontal gene transfer, the CTXM15, which is a particular um, problematic extended spectrum beta lactamase that confers resistance to many different beta lactams, penicillins, cephalosporins, and so forth. All right. Let's just uh, change gear again and, and look at another aspect of evolution. So Darwin had this big idea about the tree of life. Um, uh, and uh, in his notebooks is the first time he mentioned it. A bit later, he, he makes this particular uh, figure, which is the very first evolution tree that he ever drew. But of course, the one you saw just now, um, that there's another, there was another one, but the, he eventually went on to create this particular entry in his notebook, the so-called um, I think uh, tree, or you know, cogito if you want to make an analogy with Descartes, um, where he, he, this is his expression of how he thinks evolution works. And you can see this amazing insight. And in fact, it's become, become so iconic of evolution that, that some people, like, probably nobody in this room is quite geeky enough for this, but some people even decorate their bodies with it and have tattoos illustrating this particular it's a great leap forward in human understanding of how evolution happened uh, by Darwin. And this is uh, so we mentioned earlier that origin of species, it's a hard read, but occasionally the, the, the rhetoric soars. Here's, one, here's uh, what Darwin said at the end of chapter 4 uh, about the great tree of life, the affinity of all beings the same class can sometimes being represented by a great tree. I believe this similarly largely speaks the truth as buds give rise by growth to fresh buds and these are vigorous branch out and over top on all sides many a feebler branch. So by generation I believe it has been with a great tree of life which covers with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth and covers the surface with ever branching and beautiful ramifications. What about bacteria in Darwin's tree of life? Well, when as I say, Darwin didn't know about bacteria when he wrote The Origin of Species. He did later on uh, uh, come in contact with a guy called Ferdinand Cohn, one of the early bacteriologists, and they did exchange uh, correspondence about bacteria. But the idea that you could actually draw phylogenetic trees of bacteria um, for most of the time since Darwin was entirely fanciful because they're just little blobs down the microscope and they have a few biochemical reactions and so forth. But you, you couldn't use that. It's not like having a skeleton of a blue whale and a, a dinosaur and being able to reconstruct evolutionary pathways. 
except it all did come together uh, in the in the sort of 1980s. Uh, particularly, this guy Carl Woese uh, was a great pioneer. who Died a few years ago now, just a few years ago, um, and he basically used sequence data. Um, so he used particularly ribosomal genes, ribosomal RNA genes, uh, as a way of drawing a, a tree of life that included not just the stuff that Darwin had been talking about, plants and animals, but all um, cellular life forms. And he, he came up with this tree here with three branches, uh, the, the bacteria, the eukaryotes, and he actually discovered a whole new domain of life uh, called the archaea. Um, and this has become an iconic tree, this trichotomy. And in fact, it very much mirrors what Darwin originally did in his very first sketch um, of an evolutionary tree. Now, if we look at evolution of E. coli, um, we have to look at variation under nature as well as in, 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 in the lab. Um, and one of the things that became clear very early on, it wasn't just this harmless organism that you get out of, out of uh, the nappies of babies. Um, it turned out that it is actually a cause of infection in humans. Um, and uh, it was uh, shown to be uh, linked to urinary tract infection uh, back in the early years of the 20th century. And it is still the commonest cause of urinary tract infection in humans. Um, it, it, and various uh, studies along the way, there was a, a probiotic strain that was isolated in 1917 that seemed to protect people from diarrhea and it's still being uh, studied now. Um, various ser serotyping showed that there was a lot of strain diversity in E. coli, um, but that you can get outbreaks of a particular strain of the same serotype. Uh, and so it showed this kind of epidemic potential. And from the 1970s onwards, there's been these various pathotypes uh, that have been described. So uh, when we're looking at diarrheal disease, we can talk about entrotoxigenic E. coli, entropathogenic, entrohemorrhagic. And we now recognize that E. coli can cause disease outside the intestine. We mentioned urinary tract infections, but also it can get into the bloodstream and cause bloodstream infections as well. Um, and this is a, a, a key problem, particularly in a healthcare associated uh, infection. Now, I was very lucky to be um, around at the, the, the in the 90s, 90s when this genomics revolution swept through bacteriology. And it, it rather fancifully, I've made uh, this is an old slide where I made the analogy that we it was a bit like turning like smudges. Uh, down a microscope into newly mapped worlds, a bit like the way the Voyager probes went through the solar system. Um, we could actually see these bacteria in all their glorious detail. And even for E. coli, where E. coli K12 was mentioned, this type strain, this lab strain, half of the genes in that strain were only revealed when they sequenced its genome. But we discovered something that was rather unexpected. Perhaps it shouldn't have been, but it was. Um, so we, we knew at the, the time that the genomics era came in that E. coli was already a highly versatile commensal pathogen and probiotic. It could do many different things. But this idea that it's the same, that you know, what's true of E. coli is true of the elephant, uh, it was shown not to be true at all. Um, uh, because what was true of one E. coli strain when we looked at their genome wasn't true of the next one. There was huge variation between one genome and another. So this is a Venn diagram from... Uh, a paper describing the, th the first three genomes of E. coli, three different strains. One of them was the non-pathogenic lab strain. One was um, a, a, uro a uropathogenic strain, a strain that causes was associated with urine tract infection. And one was um, a so-called entrohemorrhagic strain associated with um, diarrhea, uh, bloody diarrhea uh, in, in humans. And what they found was that the number of genes that they had in common was only just 39%. There were more genes that they didn't have in common in the, in the E. coli gene pool than they actually had in common. So this so-called core genome is actually small, a small fraction of what we now call the pan genome. Um, and a, you know, about a, a third of the genome kind of varies um, up, uh, between one strain um, and the next. And this is a huge variation. Um, from one strain to the next. And this is the result of horizontal, primarily of horizontal gene transfer. So it's clear that E. coli isn't quite behaving in this tidy way where you can draw a tree um, and uh, ancestor and descendant have a very simple relationship. 
it, it, it's, it's a lot murkier than that. The core genome perhaps you can draw trees for, but the rest of it's much harder. And as we move forward and look at many more uh, things, many more genomes of e different strains of E. coli, we see the same pattern here. So in this particular figure here, the red bits are bits of the genome that are not found in K12. And you can see that different um, strains of, of E. coli um, have uh, really large amounts of their genome that are quite different from what's seen in the supposed type strain. Now, having said that, you can still draw phylogenies of E. coli. Um, there's a paper from a couple of my former colleagues where they looked at the evolution of the E. coli phylogeny. Um, and basically, you can draw a big family tree, a big evolutionary tree of, of, e. coli, of different E. coli strains. One interesting observation became clear uh, fairly early on in the eight days of genomics and gene sequencing was in fact Shigella, although we give it a different genus name, is just another kind of E. coli and it's nested deep within the E. coli phylogeny and in fact the Shigella kind of pathotype if you like has evolved independently on several different occasions primarily by horizontal gene transfer of a particular plasmid. Um, and evolution, uh, the evolutionary perspective for looking at variation and population structure is continuing to give us new surprises. So just in recent years there are these so-called cryptic clades of E. coli that people have overlooked before uh, that appear to uh, exist uh, predominantly in the environment rather than in the gut um, and, and the um, variation uh, is seen to be increasing over time. A few years ago I got involved in a study where we looked at entotoxigenic E. coli and we sequenced uh, the genome of, of, of one type strain, but then we did a various um, sequencing studies to look at the variation of, of where the different uh, entotoxigenic strains that we had sat on the phylogeny. And what we found was there was this riotous variation among the different ETEC strains. So that they sat on different parts of the phylogeny. So what this means is that their chromosomes are all quite different. And the only thing that actually makes them into an ETEC is the fact that they get a plasmid uh, encoded toxin that's acquired on a plasmid. Um, and this, again, uh, uh, throws away, demolishes this typological thinking that you can take one ETEC strain and say it's a type strain for that particular pathotype. And people were trying to develop a vaccine against ETEC on various chromosomal determinants, which you can see is fairly hopeless um, in this. And we now know that there's all sorts of genes coming and going and genetic determinants, and there's a lot of of fluidity in the evolution of E. coli as time goes on. Now, um, back in 2011, uh, there was a, a, an example of, uh, of the power of E. coli to disrupt even the most modern high-tech societies in, in that there was this outbreak of a particular serovirus of E. coli, 0104H4, uh, 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 an enterohemorrhagic variant of E. coli that caused over 5,000 cases and, and more than 50 deaths um, in, in Germany. Um, and when that was analysed, we got involved in analysing the earliest uh, genome sequence from that particular outbreak. But a little while later, um, another group came and looked at the German outbreak strains and they put them in the context they drew a, a phylogeny. And now this is a very common thing to be doing in bacteria is to draw these evolutionary trees. So we've come from this being something that 30 years ago you couldn't even conceive of doing to something that's become commonplace. And in fact the health labs, public health labs are doing this all the time now, drawing these phylogenetic trees or E. coli and trying to place strains within an outbreak context to say that some of them are um, in a particular outbreak and some are not. And what their key point with this was that that outbreak um, in Germany was very clonal. It obviously was just one point source uh, uh, of a strain that then explosively went across the whole of Germany in one episode. But if you look to other um, strains, related strains, they've been evolving over time. And in one individual, in fact, there was almost as much evolution in strains coming out of one individual than there was in the E. coli outbreak in Germany. But this entrohemorrhagic E. coli pathotype also, or sugar toxin producing E. coli, um, actually also produces an evolutionary conundrum because we've got uh, this terrible disease in humans with bloody diarrhea, uh, anemia, 
damage to the brain and kidneys and so forth. And we acquire this. We don't. This isn't spread from one human to another. Or at least if that happens, it happens very rarely. The primary way in which humans catch this is from cattle, um, either from eating uh, cattle products, uh, burgers and so forth. Occasionally you get it indirectly because um, the crops have got contaminated with, uh, with cow feces. Um, but the thing is, we're a dead-end host. So this disease doesn't um, transmit from one human to another. But the causative agent of the, 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 the principal cause of the disease, this sugar toxin, as it's called, it's produced by these strains, it doesn't actually cause disease in cows. So you have to say, well, what's the point of sugar toxin? Why do we have this horrible disease? How can we place this disease in an evolutionary context? Um, and a few years ago, I wrote a review in Nature where we, we said, actually, basically, we need to start looking at these infections in an, what we might call an eco-evo view. Um, so, again, people have got very used to the idea that all these pathogens are put out there. Now, okay, maybe, I don't know whether they're created by God or Satan or whatever in this viewpoint, but they're out there created to cause disease in us. And that's what they're for. And, and, and the virulence determinants are all there to cause disease in us. In fact, if we take an evolutionary and ecological view, it's clear that E. coli has to struggle for existence, not just to cause disease in humans and spread through mutants, but to interact with all these other kind of life forms. Um, and it, 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 when we look at, the, uh, at those interactions and that struggle for existence, we can get new insights. So here's a, an example of where they looked at, well, why is it that we can get E. coli in the bloodstream? Because once the E. coli gets in the bloodstream, it can't spread to another person. Uh, and what they showed is that some strains um, are able to get into the bloodstream because they're kind of geared up with things that are useful for them um, in, the, in the gut that coincidentally... Uh, allow them to get into the bloodstream. And here's a, a, a potential e explanation of why do we get this STEC uh, disease? Why, wh what's the STEC uh, toxin doing? Um, and the, the latest thinking is it's probably involved in survival of the E. coli in the cow gut, where the E. coli is struggling with predatory protozoa. Um, a more radical view might be that it's not actually the E. coli that's benefiting, it's the phage that carries that particular toxin. So the toxin is carried on a bacterial virus, a bacteriophage that integrates into the chromosome um, and lives inside the E. coli for many generations. But when times get tough, it then destroys the E. coli and releases the toxin at the same time. And one view of that may be that it's two different organisms scrapping over their food source. Both the grazing protozoa and the phage are both eating E. coli. Um, but we, we still haven't quite got there. But this is um, uh, the, the, from, from the, a paper where they're looking at this, uh, trying to explain this, basically as far as the E. coli is concerned. It's concerned with interacting with amoebae uh, and protists and so forth. Um, and it's the same... Uh, uh, determinants that are uh, used in that interaction in nature that happens just by chance to spill over and cause similar interactions in the human system that cause disease. Okay, so this is going on a bit long, but we're nearly finished. Um, has anyone got any questions or comments on anything I've said up till now? No? Okay. So, another issue that E. coli illustrates is this issue of the evolution of complexity. So um, Darwin struggled with this, you know, how, how can you evolve something like the eye, um, where it's got all these different component parts and they come together. One key component of E. coli that is uh, used to illustrate the evolution of complexity is, is a system known as the type 3 secretion system. And in fact there are a variety of different kinds of type 3 secretion system. Um, the bacterial flagellum, uh, the chief organelle of motility in bacteria, actually employs a bacterial type 3 secretion system to transport proteins across the cell envelope. It's a very sophisticated um, kind of molecular motor uh, that actually is involved in transporting those proteins. But we also do see uh, other type 3 secretion systems that are involved in the export of um, 
uh, effectors, virulence effectors, that are involved in, in actually subverting eukaryotic cells. And I got involved a few years ago in studying one particular genetic locus, the locus for enterocyte effacement, which we kind of thought, you know, this is a self-contained module that gets shoved into the genome that encodes a secretion apparatus and various translocated effectors that go with it. Um, and that, that, if you're thinking like an engineer and you're thinking, oh yeah, life should be modular, you're basically bringing this particular um, um, uh, gene locus into an E. coli, it gives us a quantum leap to a new phenotype. But what we did was we did a study where we actually said, well, maybe there are other effectors elsewhere in the genome that aren't actually encoded in the same locus. Maybe we should get rid of this idea that, the, um, that everything has to be modular. And what we found was that, they, in fact, there were uh, dozens and dozens of effectors uh, and, and, and a couple of dozen effector loci uh, uh, spread across the genome. We did uh, some pro uh, well, uh, uh, collaborators did proteomics um, and translocation assays were done. And basically what happened was we showed that there was a much larger repertoire of these effectors than we expected to see when we started out, when we just look at that one locus. Um, and the interesting development that we found was that these effectors were generally encoded in bacteriophage genomes. So again, this is another example where um, a virulence factor is actually carried on a bacterial virus that is integrated into the chromosome. And basically, evolution is far more complex than we can, can imagine, if you like, because we, we think as engineers, you just plug in some genes and you get a fin up. But here, that particular Li, the, the, the locus enterocyte in place, the phenotype it's producing is actually the result of interactions with all these other loci that are producing effectors um, that go through the system as well. That was just a little side issue, a uh, side, side step there to just talk about um, some of the work I've done. But type 3 secretion, in particular the flagellum, has actually become a real hot topic, certainly in the past. I, I think at the moment, I haven't looked to see how much of this is going on, but 10 years ago, um, it was actually at the heart of uh, a big court case in America, um, uh, in Dover, Pennsylvania, where they were trying to teach um, e uh, you know, what they called intelligent design theory in the American classroom, and this was considered to be a religious doctrine, and they had to sh all these issues were there. So the intelligent design movement, they're basically a, uh, an offshoot of creationism, which made the point that actually this thing looks like a kind of propeller um, and a, a, with a complicated motor, and it looks like it's been designed by an engineer. And, you know, and if it, is, if it is, um, looks designed, then maybe it is designed and that evolution's wrong, and that you know, the world was created by an intelligent designer, the biological world, rather than uh, evolved. Um, and it's kind of interesting the way this is, um, yeah, this has come into the fore. And, and you know, it was an issue, this was an issue even for Charles Darwin, the origin species, you know, the idea that um, complex organs and instincts could be perfected by uh, means superior to, though analogous with human reason, accumulation of slight variations each could be. Now, it is challenging to say, well, how can you really get there in a series of graded steps, and how can this come about? Um, and what the um, ID creationist people have said is that, you know, the, the, the flagellum must be the work of a, an intelligent design because it shows irreducible complexity. The, it can only function when all the various parts are put together. The various parts on their own don't do anything only when you put them together. Um, and so how can you get from all these parts being individual parts suddenly coming together through graded steps, gradual steps? In fact, the argument is, uh, this is the kind of argument that they're putting forward. In fact, it's a stupid argument. Um, it's stupid. Uh, Nick Matsky back in the day used to tell me off, I shouldn't talk about theological arguments, but it's a bit of a stupid argument anyway, because why would intelligent designer may be God, why would he create a bacterial flagellum uh, in the first place when in fact one of the roles of the bacterial flagellum in E. coli is to allow the organism to swell up the urinary tract and cause urinary tract infections. Um, and so this is a little cartoon where billions of years ago this bacterium 
was upset because it couldn't swim about, so Godman comes along and gives it um, some flagella. And, and then you fast forward to the present day and someone says, um, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling so well because I've got an infection. Basically, about 10 years ago, we, this, this all came to a head, uh, or maybe about 12 years ago, I think it was. Um, uh, and I wrote a couple of pieces where we actually looked at this as a case example. And we showed that, oops, um, something's gone wrong. Why is that? Skip. Just a bit. And then we've got a problem here. I don't know what's going on. There we go. Um, that actually, the answer to this conundrum is that the individual parts may have different bits and functions, but they, they can work together uh, to make functions are much less complicated, less complex than the, the big function associated with the biochemical machine. Um, and that new functions can emerge from combinations of components. And so there's no great leap required. Um, and, and, and so we can explain flagella evolution um, uh, in re through a series of steps. And if you're interested, you can look at the papers where we also show that all the components that are found in the bacterial flagellum have homologues elsewhere, or have homologues within the bacterial flagellum, suggesting there are no great leaps required. I'm starting to run out of time. I'm certainly running out of energy, but let's just a couple more slides. So another uh, point that Darwin made was about vestigiality. Um, and you could see vestigial organs or vestigial instincts and functions um, that only made sense if you looked at evolution. So this is a part of the E. coli K12 chromosome. And in the middle there, there's that FIHA gene. These are two genes that are actually, look, by homology, look like they're flagella genes. But they're just kind of stuck here doing nothing. There's not even a promoter between them. This was like a conundrum. What on earth is this little funny flagella gene cluster doing in K12? It doesn't seem to have any function. But it was only when we looked at... Um, uh, other uh, uh, E. coli genomes, particularly enteroagrative E. coli genome, it became clear that in those strains there's a huge 50 gene flagella cluster that encodes a second, or potentially encodes, a second flagella system in E. coli. And what we see in the type strain E. coli K12 is actually just a derived vestigial version of that particular locus. And if you look at the different strains of E. coli, uh, and look at the variation, you see a lot of variation in this particular locus. Most of the time, um, it is broken and not functioning, but it does appear that it is uh, probably, uh, was pro probably present in the last common ancestor of all the current E. coli strains. And we still don't know quite what it, what it did and why it was there. Anyway, I've pretty much finished now. Where, where's all this going? I mean, we've spoken about evolution. In a sense, um, we need to move beyond evolution, and, and certainly in terms of uh, looking at the ecology of, of E. coli, we need to look at natural environments, um, and we need to sort of work out what makes an E. coli fit, uh, strain fit in various different uh, places. Um, uh, here's a quote from Carl Woes uh, shortly before he died about the fact that we do need to embed organisms in an evolutionary and environmental context. Um, Here's an example where if you want to look at E. coli, not, not in a flask, but what it does in organisms, in its host organism, uh, there's a recent paper where they looked at evolution of an E. coli when they put it into a mouse gut uh, and saw what happened to that particular strain over time. And what they found was that in, 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 instead of what they, you would thought, which is it would acquire lots of point mutations, the major driver was, in fact, it was acquiring DNA from bacteriophages uh, and through horizontal gene transfer from other organisms that were already present in the gut. And although I've uh, completely dissed the idea of intelligent design as an explanation for why E. coli looks like it does today, taking things forward, the promise of synthetic biology is that we can use intelligent design and we can improve on nature. Um, and there's a lot of interest in using E. coli as a smart probiotic, uh, where you can actually design new functions into this uh, organism and use it um, to um, manipulate uh, um, ecosystems, provide healthcare benefits and other benefits as well. And what we've been doing in my lab is we've been taking the bacterial flagellum and fiddling around with it and actually sticking uh, enzyme uh, uh, domains onto the, uh, sticking them onto the surface of bacterial flagellum to endow the E. coli strains with new functions.
So, in conclusion, you can argue that E. coli is a kind of mirror on the world. Um, we know it's a, a evolved, not designed. It's a fearful uh, adversary, still poorly understood. It gives us hope for the future, though, because we can manipulate it. Um, this particular picture here, so say there's a, there's a, is a surrealist painting, um, and the point of it is that this isn't a pipe, this is a picture of a pipe. Uh, and it, it just highlights that discrepancy between the image of a thing and the thing itself. And one of the issues with E. coli as a lab strain is it's kind of an image of biology rather than real biology. We need to kind of connect the things together. So, this is the end of the course. And the only way we can end this course, Darwin, in one of his letters, said that um, uh, as with a book, as with a fine day, you want to end with a glorious sunset. The closing words of the origin of species actually are um, uh, an example of, of, of Darwin's uh, rhetorical powers. This is what he said, there's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling, on, uh, on, uh, cycling to the, uh, onto the fixed law of gravity, um, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Now, rather than um, you just listen to me saying it, it's, it's just a little, I'll give you a little snip of some uh, Baba Brinkman evolutionary rap to, to close things. Um, if you're particularly interested in, in this kind of sci-art interface, I'll put up some other links as well um, on the website um, to stuff that's even more... Um, kind of That's the only use of the E word in the origin of species. If you want to know more about the evolution of those particular, those, that particular sentence, you'll have to come to Darwin Day when I'll be talking about that.